Hello, this is Unsung with Gameleap, and today we're going to be giving you an in-depth J4 guide. Jarvan has always been and will always be one of the top dogs of the jungle. His kit is simple, effective, and can be used in creative ways, which allows for this longevity. Whether you pick up Jarvan now or in a year from this video's release, all of these tips and tricks will always hold true. This guide is going to be broken up into a few sections, so make sure that you pay attention to each one. Let's go ahead and begin with early game. As with all junglers, pathing is what decides between us winning a game in the first three minutes or losing outright. Here are a few questions that you should be asking yourself basically every game. Is the enemy team weak early? Do I have laners that can help me? Will we get enough of a lead to justify my gank? If we decide yes to these, then we can go for a cheese path. We'll explain the exact pathing in just a moment. J4 has and always will be one of the best cheese junglers in League of Legends for a few reasons. First and foremost, we can outplay our opponents incredibly easily using our EQ. Even if our EQ gets flashed, we can flash on our opponent afterwards to still hit the knockup, and at worst, force a recall from our opponent. At best, we secure a kill and trade flash for flash, which is always worth on a jungler. Second, J4 is not exceptionally level reliant. He's useful with any amount of gold or levels. This makes spam ganking a viable option even in the most farm heavy metas. And lastly, J4 is used utility king. There is no other champion that can lock down an opponent for as long and as safely as J4 while also providing so many free stats for his team. In a perfect world, we can EQ, ulti, and then Q to our E again to remove somebody from a fight for upwards of 5 seconds at a time. This combo when combined with Gordrinker, Sterix, Zhonyas, or Gargoyle is pretty much guaranteed to go off, leading to vastly one-sided fights. If we're able to buy time for our team, our total score does not matter because we are at a minimum taking one person with us. J4's E when placed also provides a massive amount of attack speed for our team, meaning us just being around is an advantage regardless of if we lock somebody. Jungle pathing is difficult. To clear things up, head over to GameLeap.com by clicking on the description box below to access our library of professional guides from coaches such as myself. See you on the site. Now that we talked about what makes J4 so strong and some early game decisions, let's get into the nitty gritty of pathing. The jungle gets reworked every other season, but it has a few concepts that have always and will always remain. We can always hit level 2 off of a single camp which will allow for cheese ganks, and our level 3 does not require a full clear of our jungle at any point. Due to this, variable gank timing exists. Here are a few examples. Both of these are for red side, but we can invert the target lane for the opposite side of the map. Red Wolves Gromp into bottom for red side, or Red Wolves Gromp into top for blue side. This pathing is incredibly fast, super effective since we're going to be ganking a duo lane, and allows us to return to our blue buff, take the crab, and then repeat the gank again. If we burn summoners on the first gank, the second will almost always result in the kill. We have a window of nearly a minute where we can camp one half of the map for low risk, high reward ganks that by design will make our opponents have to give CS or die for farming. This variable gank timing is what makes jungle so frustrating to deal with in the hands of a good jungler. There is essentially going to be at minimum a minute where we're going to be on that side of the map and the opponent has to ward for us. If they ward, then we get the cooldown and we can take another path. If they ward river, then we can get that cooldown, EQ over into the tri bush, and still get a successful gank. Best case scenario for our opponent is that they get zoned for the full minute that we're there. Worst case scenario is we end up blowing their summoners, come back, get another kill on them, crash a wave, and then repeat the gank again to ensure a win in that 3 minute period. Blue Grump Wolves to top lane is the inverse of this clear, and it has the same timing with the same exact benefits. Regardless of the exact pathing, these gank timings will always exist even in any future rework jungle, making them permanently solid options. After our initial clear, we want to try and rush for level 6 as soon as possible mostly looking for ganks when our camps are on cooldown. J4 is more of an opportunistic jungler compared to most other junglers. This means that even if all of our camps are not on cooldown, we could still fish for and force a gank out. Since J4 has such a large amount of early game damage and a decent amount of crowd control, there's basically no champion that is safe. If for whatever reason we're unable to execute on this, then we want to full clear. Full clears are usually reserved for when we have a scaling team with no prio. Jarvan slots well into these comps due to his disabler nature, even if we're unable to impact the map, we could still buy our team time late game. This does mean that power farming on J4 is a viable option, just not the most optimal. Let's go ahead and go over some professional examples of just how oppressive this champion can be. To begin the clip, J4 is farming his blue buff. This is going to be a standard gank. Essentially, we get our camp, and then we see an opportunity to go straight towards top lane. Sometimes against J4, you just get unlucky because he's in the right place at the right time. This is one of those instances. This is why we always need to make sure that we're paying attention to essentially every lane that we're around, and then look for these opportunistic plays. This play looks like it's going to be a regular trade and not really turn into anything, but J4 slides across the entire jungle quadrant, goes in quickly using an EQ, and then gets the ulti 
to seal Pledge's fate. The golden rule of jungle is making an efficient, beneficial use of your time always, and power farming isn't going to have as much benefit as getting successful ganks off. Now that we've explained how we should approach the early game and some pathing options, let's go ahead and go over some quick combos. First and foremost, GeForce Passive deals more damage based on the target's current health, so ideally we begin any of these combos with a good old smack before continuing the beatdown. EQ Flash is going to be our bread and butter in the early game. We can use this to extend our effective range and also react to enemy flashes. Reminder, if we do not hit the Dragon Strike damage, we only get the knockup from this effect. The knockup that J4 applies when dragging himself to his standard is tied to J4's hitbox, not to his Q, meaning that this does literally zero damage unless the enemy was in our Q at the time of cast. This combo is one of the more difficult things for us to do on J4 as it requires strict timing. I would recommend sitting in practice tool and feeling it out. Since the hitbox for our knockup begins on J4, it has a larger or smaller radius depending on our enemy's body type as well. A chonker like Scion is easier to knock up, whereas a thin and weak gamer Vladimir is substantially harder to hit due to his lithe frame. Next up we have the R into EQ combo. This is best used to lock down no mobility control mages or AD carries. If we flash R and then knock them up with an EQ combo as we exit our own cataclysm, our opponent has minimal time to deal damage and is forced to sit in place for 3.5 seconds. They then become a sitting duck for our team. The extended combo is going to be EQ into R into Q back to our flag afterwards. This is 5 seconds of agony for anybody on the receiving end of it. If you are a champion that has no access to flash, if you do not have a dash or any sort of blink, then you are not going to have a good time. Now that we talked about trading in lane a little bit, let's go ahead and talk about other ganks through flank paths. As you can see here, the normal thing for most junglers to do is simply walk into river. There's a ward very clearly in the pixel bush in the river. Most junglers wouldn't be able to get much out of this, but as J4, we have the luxury of being able to go over terrain quite easily, and especially when we're against an immobile mage, this is still going to be an effective gank. As you can see, MNS flashes away, but it's not enough. The sheer amount of damage that J4 puts down allows a to get within range and then finish off the kill. The only counterplay to Cataclysm if you're in a mobile mage is flashing. This is an example of looking for a flank path or an unconventional angle to actually get off your ultimate. Mid and late game will result in more fights around Rift Herald, Baron, and Drake. It's best for us to begin an objective without blowing cooldowns, secure the objective, and then full engage in a choke while using our ultimate. J4 is a beast in these jungle fights due to the thin walkways. An EQ here is almost guaranteed to knock on multiple enemies, while our R can cut off entire pathing routes to prevent help from arriving. This, however, isn't always possible, so what we can do instead is full initiate for our team by hitting an EQ, apply our passive, and then ulting with an additional auto or gore drinker afterwards to burst a target down. This is your assassination combo. If they don't outright die to this combo, they're going to be at about 10% and easy for our allies to make quick work out of. Regardless of where we're fighting, we want to look for a few things first. Flank routes near terrain are of the utmost importance to J4. Not many champions have such a fast, powerful engage from out of vision. Putting an R on a carry is usually enough to win a fight, so we don't want to remain visible and give them an opportunity to kite us out or space us. This is why Sweeper is a must on J4. It creates lapses in the enemy's vision where we can easily surprise them and win a fight before it even begins. Always look for creative angles, don't be honest and show where you're coming from. If we sweep an area and we know that there's no vision there, then we should probably stick to that area. If we don't have our Sweeper available, we can still threaten with our insanely large engage range from EQ, Flash, and then R. Next up, pay attention to enemy spacing. If the ADC or mobile mid is lagging behind, feel free to put them in jail and then leave side where they're unable to make it to the fight. Instant 4v5 is one of the most impactful things that you could get out of J4's ulti, so looking for this angle should always be on your mind. J4's ultimate is around a minute cooldown, flash is 5 minutes, you get the point. Don't be afraid to flash R and save your EQ to get out of your own cataclysm when you see an opportunity. Once again, if we trade flash for our ultimate, then we have 4 more ultimates that we can put down on our opponent safely before their flash is back up. Sometimes neither of these will be enough and we'll just have to engage without an advantage. This is where Hourglass, Sterics, and Gargoyle all come into play. Ideally we get a rotation off, use an item, get off another rotation, and then pray that our team has won the fight in the meantime. In these cases we also have a designated target priority, so we're not just trading our life for nothing. First and foremost we want immobile damage dealers. Next up we want regular damage dealers, with some mobility. Now we want supports afterwards and then tanks. This is pretty self-explanatory. Champs that can't escape J4 jail cannot contribute to a fight and are therefore useless. On the contrary, there is no use in locking down something like Kai'Sa because she can just R out of her ultimate and leave us in the dust. However, if we combo and burst a champion down like this, then we could still get some value from this. CCing a Lulu and locking her out is nice, but if she's still able to stall us while her ADC pops off, all of our cooldowns are used on nothing effectively. This is a worst case scenario for Jarvan. Tanks are tanks, it's illegal to try and one-shot them, written in the rules probably. The only exception to this rule is if we are CCing something like Orn. If Orn can't get his ultimate off because we're locking him away and is prevented from applying supplementary CC, then this is worth. But 9 times out of 10, we want to be disabling the enemy backline instead of peeling for our own backline. J4 is a great peel champion. 
but he's used most optimally in an offensive setting. Let's go ahead and watch River closely during this fight. River intelligently walks up to threaten the Cataclysm on these immobile carries. Licorice also walks up to him, making for a very scary frontline. River then positions himself in the back of the pit to lead to a massive four-man Cataclysm. There are four champions in this pit that have no real mobility. J4 is incredibly oppressive into no mobility champions for this exact reason. There is no way to outplay Cataclysm. Even if we lose a fight, we could still have a huge impact by simply playing intelligently, looking for good buffers, and finding these flanks. These are some of the best tools that I could have possibly given you to get you into games as J4 as quickly as possible. I hope that this guide will shape how you approach the jungle as a whole, as these concepts are applicable on just about every jungler. Anyways, thank you all for watching, and hope you all have a wonderful day. I'll see you guys in the next video.